Hi, and welcome to this edition of A Conversation With, and today joining us in studio, the Executive Director of the YWCA, Gail Fortz, my friend. Good nice seeing you. you. Nice seeing you too, Jim. Thanks Thank for you. coming in. Thanks for having me. Um, bringing you in, obviously, as, as you and I had uh, emailed talking to each other, it's Women's History Month, but yeah. there's so much that you do, obviously, pertaining to women and women's history, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of, from your job um, and your um, what you're doing is based on history mm -hmm. too, how you're yes. improving things, conditions for women. and mm -hmm. um, So it's, it's timely to do that. Yes, right. yes. I mean, the Women's History Month, I mean, every day could be Women's History Month, and, uh, but we have so many different things going on. It's crucial to our mission of the elimination of racism and the empowerment of women, but the YWCA is a long term, you know, since 1911, we've been here, you know, in southeastern Massachusetts and, I mean, globally, you know, YWCAs are all over the country and, and other countries starting in the 1850s. So there's, there's a lot of uh, history of, of women that we all stand on the shoulders of here. You've today. been um, at the, uh, the agency a long time. A long time. I always joke. I was born and raised here. <laughs> I'm curious, though, especially, and in, in you've had this, you, you know, you've been the executive director for a long time, too, but I'm curious yes, as to, yes. with the pandemic right now, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, how has the pandemic changed, not the mission, but how you pursue the mission, really? Yes, well, we, we have never stopped. I think we're busier than ever. Uh, our mission has really been crucial day-to-day -day services. I mean, it's hard to believe it's been a year ago today that, mm -hmm. that we started this, and I think we all thought, I know I thought, okay, we'll be home for a week or two, and then things will you know, go back to normal, but that as the gravity of the situation um, and unfolded, we as a staff immediately looked to, okay, how do we provide this, the same services that we are still providing on a daily basis? For example, we have two residential programs yep. that we serve low-income women that, you know, successful we are programs successful, and a lot of, lot of um, you know, work that goes into yeah. it, but we're responsible for these women. And I, I felt strongly that we wanted to make sure that they were safe, that their health was taken care of, and that they had um, everything that they needed you know, at the time it was finding toilet paper, getting masks and <laughs> <laughs> sanitary, like as much as we laugh, you know, about it. But we literally were, you know, going through everything that we had purchased, you know, in stock, you know, going down in our basements and even people bringing things from home right. to make sure that not only our residents, but, you know, some of the women, especially the senior women that we work with that were isolated and shut in to, to have those needs. So we quickly, you know, got on the phone with people mm -hmm. and did wellness checks calling, you know, every program participant, every parent, you know, of children in childcare, because, you know, the world, you know, pretty much stopped. And I think everybody was in flux of what to do. And that's how we based on, you know, how do we, you know, provide services remotely, which, which we do, as well as what are we doing in person, which, you know, we still, you know, now we're doing it every two weeks, but we're still delivering food right. to about 20 families you know, ev every single week, cleaning products, you know, and as you laugh, masks, <laughs> toilet paper, you know. Have you uh, seen, um, I don't want to say the mission change, but the requests, have they been different from what your, prior to COVID, um, some of the things that, oh wow, we never dealt with this before. Mm -hmm. um, yes, definitely. We've just had, I think, you know, the YWCA is a trusted, you know, organization in the city. And if we can't provide the service, we know that we can help find other yep. resources for them. So there have been some requests for that. We've been able to access gift cards through some funding through community development block grant from the city to provide, you know, needed services for people that just were, were afraid to even go to the supermarket or get some basic needs or refer them to places like the United Way for a rent, a rental assistance. Right. So that, again, it was really those basic, basic needs that are crucial to, you know, survival. You know, and as time has moved on, I think what's changed is people who never needed assistance before needed assistance because they were unemployed. Mm -hmm. Or, and that's, know, it's funny, we've had Payson, United mm -hmm. Way, and they've said the same thing. Yep. The people that were donating are now the ones that need the help. Exactly, which was very different and I think, you know, challenging for people. I think a lot of people have a lot of pride, you know, when it comes to that and, and needing assistance and there's, there's no judgment. It, it doesn't matter, you know, who it is and if we're, we're here to help, you know, everyone. And then the other piece was being home, you know, with your children 24 hours a day and right. now being a teacher being a child care provider and, and trying to work, you know, from home as well. So we, um, we are a remote learning site. We opened back up in July, but we were closed for a while with the child care, you know, as everything was happening from March through June. But we were, again, calling parents, helping, you know, do you need a laptop? Do you need help with Wi-Fi? And can we help with any type of academic support that we could provide? And then just some fun stuff. We would 
we dropped off like backpacks filled with crayons and mm -hmm. puzzles and books, you know, not only for children, but for adults too, and provided some parenting um, groups that they could just get on a Zoom, as you know, it's a Zoom world now for a lot well, of us, yeah. to just unwind and, hey, I need help with, and, and, and it's okay to, to ask for help. And, but as soon as we could open our doors and we were allowed to open, so July 6th, since then, we've been a remote learning site. And now, you know, as the children are prepared to go back to school, some of our have been going hybrid, you know, since September, right. but again, being able to provide that so parents can go to work. We have a lot of parents that are frontline workers and they've worked since the beginning. They have never stopped. It's been a lifeline for, for a lot of the parents. Um, from the staff perspective, have, have you been, because um, I know that you haven't stopped, mm -hmm. especially you're, even at the start, you're getting the request, but so I would imagine a lot of the staff was working from home and yes. making them, was that making it difficult to, to execute? Again, I think it was a learning curve for yeah. myself included for, for everybody, because I think I know I had used Zoom a few times for you know nationwide YWCA calls, but other than that, most people had not used it and making sure that our staff, um, we were very lucky, we had um, some funding from the South Coast Community Foundation to make sure all of our staff had laptops and whatever they needed to yeah. work successfully um, remotely. Luckily, we just finished our, our building. We had opened you know in the fall of right. 2019, and I always say I'm so thrilled and happy that we finished that capital project because we wouldn't have been able to do everything we were doing now if we were still under construction. So we were able to, we had things we had put in place that we didn't know that we had as far as our Wi-Fi networks and changed, you know, upgraded our internet and Wi-Fi. So even the voicemails, so you can use your phone from home and, right. you know, so utilizing all those tools and figuring out how to use them, you know, was, was Plus, first yeah. a challenge. And, you know, we're, we're a small staff, you know, 24 people. So you're used to working together and, you know, most people share offices, so getting used to, and peop we're people people, you know, we're used to being out in the community, you know, doing groups, and you know, so to, that was a learning curve. For, and the biggest for challenge I think people have said is that the hardest part has been the lack of the one-on-one -on -one yes. conversations, because, yes. you know, I had Tony Cabral in here recently, and talking even um, with Cheryl at the health center, it's like those one-on-one -on -one conversations, you can get stuff done, right? and now you don't have that. Not right. that things aren't getting done, right? but, maybe it's not as quickly or maybe it's the decision making is slower because you're not able to explain or mm -hmm. just have those conversations. Right, right, somebody comes, hey, can I talk to you for a second? When they come to your office door, so it's just like setting up those times where staff can have opportunities to talk with me or their supervisor. Like we did weekly check-ins with the staff as well. So that way we could, you know, address address those needs. And now as we started, you know, 25% capacity in the office, now we're 50% you know, capacity, but, you know, following all the guidelines. And I think, you know, it's going to be a learning curve going back, you know, too. I would imagine, you know, the way you do business is going to change when, ho when normal comes back. I, th I think so, Jim. I think, you know, there's some aspects, you know, of remote work that I think we'll keep, like some of the Zooms I think we'll, we'll keep for, you know, shorter, you know, term meetings, but not able to, like you said, that meeting in person. You're like, I'm so excited to be here to come, <laughs> come and, you know, see you in person. and and do this but even our board of directors i mean we've they've met every month you know via zoom and we've had an annual meeting that way we brought our new board members i did board orientation for the first time you know via zoom but they're, they're excited to to get back in person you know too as well to you know do do their work and how many people right now do you have at the residential facilities we have two facilities so our capacity is um 16 so eight Eight, eight, eight at each facility, and we've had not much turnover um, since the pandemic. Oh, I think people have really stayed put um, for a, a long time, and you know, going to school. We had some people that were laid off, unfortunately, right. but we we put every protocol in place, working with the health department and Demone's office very closely to make sure. And we were very fortunate that we didn't have any cases, you know, in the residence. And I think now that it's you know, some people are looking to move on because they can stay as long as they want because it's permanent housing. Right. Um, but they can, we have a few that hopefully, you know, might transition to their own apartment, you know, someday. And that's something, you know, we, we hope to help them with and get all their resources in place. I don't think so that people they can do that. realize how many people you help on a weekly, monthly, annual basis. Yes, it's yes. A, it's got to be staggering. I it's mean, hundreds. Oh, thousands. 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 Yeah. We had last year, even with the pandemic, over 3,000 people between direct service provision remote learning and we do it a lot of zoom calls um, after you know the whole um, issues in the summer with the death of um, George Floyd we did a lot of community conversations where we had 500 people participate where that might not have happened in person 
where with Zoom, you know, you can have people the comfort of your own home at any time, right. you know, do that. And we've been doing racial justice workshops that way monthly. And we're uh, collaborating with a lot of uh, businesses and schools and as well to do professional development and, and workshops for people that really looking at what, you know, anti-racism looks like, diversity, equity, and inclusion looks like and what that means, you know, for their organization. And we're doing all of that via Zoom where normally that would have all been, you know, in person as well as the financial literacy workshops, you know, for women too. And we have actually even a program that we're doing for Wh Women's History Month are all, you know, via Zoom. A couple of things here is, is, and we talk sort of about gender and, and, and racial issues. I, I was thinking, and then I showed you the article in the paper about the people who have been impacted mm -hmm. by the pandemic work-wise. Yes, and it's yeah. obviously disproportionate for women and women of color. Mm -hmm. How can we address that? How do we help that? I think being, you know, educated, you know, about it and understanding that, you know, women typically you know are the ones at home you know with their children during remote schooling and i think once every the reality set in that this was going to be a long-term thing at, at least for the year people had to make some hard decisions too so i think staying home and being available you know fell on on to the women and for and women of color as you said those statistics you know are, are devastating it was, it was staggering they're, i mean they're I, I had never seen stats that. until i saw the article and when it's i showed you that it was unbelievable it's, it's unbelievable and it's hard it's going to be very difficult for you know a lot of these professional women as well that you know are staying home and then to go back into the workforce we've even before the pandemic this has been tough for women that were stay-at-home moms to you know or they didn't finish their degree to go back mm. in and you have this huge gap on your resume well what have you been doing for six years well i've been raising my family right. and, wh and why is that a penalty where you know if you go home and but you know you have a family too and it's not like oh you have to leave early for this game or you have a doctor's appointment there's still that you know that bias a little bit of you know that you have to take care of your family and it's not you know recognized for for what it is and, and how you, important it is and you have the perspective you are a mom yeah, you I'm have the family. I do. Mm -hmm. um, and not everybody has the family support. I'm very fortunate that when my, ch I mean, now my children are older, but you know, when I first started in this position, my children were little. So to come in to be the executive director and you have two little children under the age of eight is, is very difficult. And I'm very lucky that I had you know, parental support to be able to do that, where many people don't. Yeah. Many people don't have a child care provider or a family member that they can do. So it limits you know, your accessibility to, to work, especially if you have to travel, you know, as you know, I, you know, especially back then, you work a lot of nights, you work a lot of mm -hmm. early mornings, sometimes on the weekends, you gotta go to Boston, you gotta do, do all of these things where, you know, 13 years later, you know, things are, are a little bit different, but my children are older, so if I have to travel, you know, I don't have to worry about childcare, but not everybody has the, that opportunity. Do you see that with the jobs and the job losses, do you see them coming back though? And, and do you see those women I don't know. I mean, they've been impacted, but do you see them getting their jobs back? I, th I, th I think it depends on the, the job, Jim. Okay. Honestly, I've, I've, you know, talking with a lot of people, the pandemic has impacted a lot. A lot of businesses, I think, are rethinking how they do things. Mm -hmm. They're looking at, you know, can we keep remote work? Do we need these big buildings? Do we need these big offices? Do we need all this stuff? When, you know, when you show sometimes that you can do all of this unlimited capacity, unlimited staffing, it, you know, administrators sometimes have to make hard decisions, especially with the businesses, if their businesses were not operating or they're running at a loss and they're looking at reductions. So I, I don't know, I'm hopeful that things will go back, but I don't know if we'll ever go back to what life was like in February right. of 2020. Right. I think I think that, that life is, is over. I think there's gonna be a new, a new day and you know, the new normal, which I don't really like that term, but I think that's what it is and as people move back in, I think some people are gonna be hesitant to, I mean, to go back into a, a workplace with 100 people. Are people, you know, gonna be comfortable with that? You don't know who has the vaccine, who doesn't. Right. So I, I think there's gonna be a lot of discussions, you know, about what that looks like. And even with parents, I mean, even with children going back to school, there's still an option. Do you wanna have remote learning, at least for the remainder of the school year? So I think there's gonna be a lot of discussions about that. And if, especially if those jobs don't exist, are the women able to find you know, an, an, another job that was paying them at what they were paying. Because as we know, you know, women are still not making equal, equal right. pay, you know, to men. And if you're a woman of color, it's, it's even less. And that those stats have not really changed. And you're talking women too. I mean, there are women with college educations. Ex I oh, mean, yes. multiple degrees exactly. that are in that in those statistics. Absolutely, the wage, the wage gap and the stats of who have, have lost jobs goes, goes the gamut from women with PhDs, you know, medical field, 
too. So it's it's not just um, affecting low income women. This is affecting, you know, women again. Like you said, they tell you get an education. You know, do this, do that, right. and, and you're doing all those things, and you can still you know lose your job or still not being paid equal to your counterparts, too. So that that still has not changed. And the jobs are gone in some cases. And the jobs are gone. The jobs are gone, and they might not be coming back. I was curious too with your take because I know that uh, you talked about the vaccines here uh, briefly but I'm curious too I mean you see the essential workers and you see those people working at the supermarkets mm -hmm. or doing the manual labor jobs if you will um, and obviously it's the people of, of color and in, in, in neighborhoods local neighborhoods and I'm yes. not sp specifying New Bedford here but just right. nationwide yes they're not getting the shots right now no and their frustration is growing mm -hmm. as to why other people are. Right, and it, it's funny that you mentioned that. We were just having this discussion yesterday in, w with some of our staff of how we could help, you know, as, as a community agency, how could we provide input and services for that? And looking at the stats, as you said, under 10% nationwide, the people of color have received the vaccine. So how do we make it accessible? How do we make it, how do we bring it to the community? Mm -hmm. How are we partnering with, you know, churches, the neighborhoods, you know, making it mobile? you know, bringing a van, whether it's a South Coast Health van or, or something right. else to some of the parks. Like, hey, let's go down to Denison. Let's go to Boys and Girls Club. Let's, where are our community partners in the community where people of color are low income people or people just without access if you don't have Wi-Fi. I mean, doing those appointments myself for family members, they couldn't do it because they don't have access. Right. Yeah. So it's like somebody has to do it and you have to navigate, you know, the healthcare system, which we all know it can be challenging. And as Rep Cabral was saying, it as, was a nightmare well. to start. And he, he seemed to think it was getting better. It's getting better, but it's it's still slow going. And as you mentioned, you know, the frontline workers, like you said, like for example, grocery pe grocery stores, they've worked since the beginning. They haven't stopped. And, and we were hailing them as heroes and praising them, and, right. and, and, and they should. Right. But yet they're getting sort of left behind right, right now. Right, right, exactly. And I know there's a push, you know, for that, for them to get it. And I mean, and everybody wants to, you know, to try to get that. And, you know, making, you know, teachers, you know, that opens up today for educators and teachers and even with our staff. And you the know, biggest problem is just There's just the access, the quantity. Just the quantity. And, and I think it's a distribution. I think, you know, just like you said, how it's rolling out because everything just happens so quickly. And I think once it gets going, hopefully it'll be better. But I mean, there, there are other resources out there that I think once we can get it, in, in the community and, not, and make it accessible. Because if you don't have transportation to get to say Circuit City or South Coast Health, you know, there's just a lot of things to work out. And, but then there's still other, you know, understanding and education I think that needs to go with it. Because, you know, people of color have that, a lot of fear about vaccines and understanding, you know, what the side effects mean. And the testing piece, a lot of people, you know, they don't want to be, you know, there's been history that's, you know, back in history of, people of color being tested, you know, as, as guinea pigs, really. And the city's health director, Demona, said that. He's mm -hmm. like, the biggest problem is trying to convince them right. that it's safe and you should take it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was a push he was trying to get out there when we did a round table right. a couple months ago. And mm -hmm. Right, and I know myself and my staff, we've attended several, you know, workshops and, and that was the first takeaway from the first one. Like, okay, how do we help and how do we educate people in terms that they understand, not medical terms and in other languages you know about you know the vaccine and its and its safety and I think you know with time I think it'll get better because a lot of people they don't want to be the first one in line either right, they want right. to see what are the side effects how how are you feeling you know afterwards and when you see people that look like you and that you trust saying do this and like hey I got my vaccine too you know like like for right now 25 percent of our staff to date you know I've had th their vaccine oh, I've, really? ha I've had mine you know, too, and then like for us telling our stories and to encourage, you know, our clients and others that, that this is safe, we'll help you, we'll go with you if you need a ride, mm -hmm. you know, to get that. And I think the more, you know, I know Immigrant Assistance Center is doing that and then a few other community providers, you know, CDC with Corinne Williams, we just got to keep talking and talking and talking to people. Of course, you can't it's enforce one at it. And that's the case, it's, it's one at a time. It's one it really at a time, is. you can't enforce it, you can't make people do it, but I think as more and more people do it and they see the benefits, of it to get back to somewhat normalcy, I, th I think it'll help. Your mission too, and uh, we've got about eight minutes left, but I wanted to touch on it, sure. the racial justice side of things. Obviously last summer, mm -hmm. uh, a, a tough summer um, yes. for the country. Yes. Um, New Bedford seemed to be, uh, just from the outside, and I mean, I know we had some shows, at least talking, people mm -hmm. were talking about the issue, and that's, and you're on a lot of committees dealing with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
where do you think, I don't want to say we stand right now, but uh, you've got the case going on in Minnesota right now in the mm -hmm. jury selection, but have we, I don't want to say turned a corner, but obviously the, the issues seem to be more in the forefront, really, than ever before. Yes, yes, I, I and agree with that. the conversations seem to be at least starting. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's going to be a good thing. I think that is a good thing. I think there's more to be done, and I think we have to keep talking about it. You know, my biggest fear is that at some point it's, it's going to be over and people are not going to talk about it, because that's happened in the past when mm -hmm. incidents of, you know, racism or, you know, someone being murdered or something similar to what we saw with George Floyd has happened in the past. You know, there's this big uproar and people talk about it, and then, unfortunately, it, it goes away. Or the next crisis happens and, mm -hmm. we and we focus on that and nobody talks about it. Again, I think this time... It is different. I think people are still talking about it. As we, we, you know, you just see it on the news today. They're picking the jurors, and you know, we have to keep it up front. And I think more people are are seeing it in a different light, or maybe even seeing it for the first time, and and talking about it. And as a community, you know, I think the video has made a huge. The difference. videos. I mean, our world is different. You know, everything is videotaped. You have your phone with you all the time. People right. are taping it, and people are talking about it because th that that's not the first time. No, you know, and, you know, no. And this is historically, you know, going back with, you know, history, this has been happening for centuries. And it's just people didn't talk about it. And people, you kind of know, but you don't know. And I think that's the difference this time. So how does the why, how do you and the why attack the issue now? It's because it's the, the, as you said, the lot. issues are still the same, but you're out and you're helping all people, mm -hmm. all races. Right. So how do you address the issue and, and try to stimulate the conversation to more people and educate more people. I, th I think, you know, people were coming to us, you know, more so than ever before. I mean, this is part of our mission. It's been part of the mission since the 70s. Right. So, so it's not anything new. We were always doing this workshops, but it was more if somebody wants to talk about it or do it versus now I think people feel this is their obligation now. Mm -hmm. I, you can't, now you know. So what are you going to do about it? And more people, like you said, it's on video. You've seen it. And people are coming to them, whether it's their staff, family members, to have these conversations. And they need resources and tools or just some place to talk, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in an after-school program, whether it's in your workplace. And as you said, you know, there's technology now. So we have, for example, we've really ramped up our racial justice offerings. We hired our first racial justice and gender equity program coordinator, which started off as full-time and now is full uh, part-time, excuse me, now is a full-time position. We have a team of four, myself is, as one of the facilitators, to do this in and mul and multiple uh, facets. So, for example, if you go on our website, we have a resource page. So, like, you know, read a book, listen to this podcast, have a community conversation. And then for people that want to, you know, do a little bit more, we have workshops that we offer to the community. And we have workplaces that are really looking at, like, let's do, let's look internally. First, you have to start with self. Right. You know, and doing that and looking at, you know, implicit bias. I mean, we all have it even people of color, we all, we all have that, and recognizing that. And then looking you know, internally at your organization, no matter what the organization is, mm -hmm. looking at your policies and procedures, looking at your hiring practices, looking at how you greet people when they um, answer the door or when they on the phone, are you making judgments you know, for people when you can't understand them or, you know, I heard somebody say the other day, you know, you know, all of these things, and it's, it's so, so important. Like the pictures that you have on your flyers, are, are they welcoming? You know, not just for people of color, but for all, you know, many other different isms, whether it's LGBTQ, right. I mean, we work on gender equity, you know, all of those. And then for people that have um, more than one thing, you know, you're, you're a woman, you're a woman of color, you're, you might be transgender, you're low income, you know, it Im the impact is, is even greater. Right. And then externally, so as a community organization or a workplace, what is the message that you're sending? You know, at, at, are you intentional about that? And I think that's the difference that more and more people are having these conversations and it, and it includes a lot of people of all races and ethnicities not just people of color you have to have everybody at the table and people that can make changes and make policy changes because a lot of these things are institutional and been having for a long time and it, it has to go to the legislative branch is there one change. simple thing people can do to improve the situation i know that maybe seems some sim simplistic but I don't know, it just seems listening would be a good start. I think listening. <laughs> I think listening is really, really important and really hearing, you know, what the, what people are saying. Because when you hear these things, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not made up. Because I think a lot of times people say, well, that can't be true. Or well, that, right. you know, can't happen. I mean, even now, seeing what's going on um, with Meghan Markle and, and Prince Harry and, and hearing, like, 
like that can't be happening that's is that true and well why would why would somebody say that if that's not true mm -hmm. i mean it, it's happened before and i think it's just again let's just have a conversation where before nobody was talking about it it was you know we don't talk about race or we don't talk about religion we don't talk about politics a lot of people you know ha you know have those things but i think now you have to because especially because it's so out there and it's on tv you know when your children are asking you what are you going to say when somebody at your job asks and part of the problem too is that there's so many voices out there right now it's hard to right. separate exactly i don't want to say fact from fiction but yeah, it really comes down to that. Right, right. And we, and like when we teach our, our workshops, we, we always start off with grounding in history because this, this is the history of the United States. This is, this is our history. And it's, it might not be what you learned in school, in high school, but th this is, you know, when you look at it or, you know, I, we always refer people to certain books or certain movies to watch. And then, and then it grounds that. And then I think a lot of people like, oh, like I didn't understand you know, and, and that. And I think a lot of people too, they, f they feel sorry or they feel guilt. And it's like, we're not doing this to shame anybody mm -hmm. or to make you feel guilty. We're just trying to educate to understand that, you know, if a person of color says that this happened to them, just listen, you know, to not always ask any, like a million questions, just like listen to their story. And it's probably, they're not looking for an answer from you. They're just, they just want you to know. Right, exactly. And when people say that, you know, this happened when, and I was followed in a store and that was right here in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was recently, you know, we were on calls and, you know, and we always keep it as a, a brave, safe space where people can, you know, speak their truth. And people were shocked that like, oh, that happened to you at such and such a place. And, and this is, these were people, people that you probably know, I'm not going to say any names. And they, and they were shocked, like, wow, this happened to you? Or, wow, they thought you were, you didn't, they couldn't accept that you were the doctor. Mm -hmm. And they thought that you were the cleaning person when you clearly had on a doctor's coat. <laughs> and, and as a person of color, Kind of a like, dead no, giveaway there. Like, no, but like, I'm the doctor. It's, it's shocking, you know, for, for people to realize that. But it, it, you know, and because we live here, I think we don't see it as much as when you go to other places. But I think it's, I'm just happy that people are having the conversation. And I just want to make sure that people keep having the, this conversation. We have, you know, our board has been really supportive. We have over 100 volunteers on committees working at, on this and really looking at how this impacts things like education and housing and, um, health care, because like, as, as we talked about with the vaccine, clearly, you know, there's, yeah. a, there's a disparity. Yeah. And I think when you look at all of these isms, you know, unfortunately, it, it goes back to race, whether people want to admit it, you know, or not. And then, you, like I said, you add all these other intersectional isms, too, with it and really understanding. But then how do we change that? We th and this didn't happen overnight and it's not going to go away overnight. Right, but exactly. as long as we keep putting... Well, if you can make a difference in, in one the person, front. then exactly. Then the one person maybe becomes two people, and then exactly, and that's what our hope after we do these workshops that now you understand a little bit more, and then you do some reading on your own, and then you're having this conversation. So, are you going to let that slide by when somebody says something, you know, to a coworker or to you? Are you going to speak up in a meeting, which is not easy? We, we've all been in meetings like that when people say something like, "Oh." You know, yeah. do you say something? Do you not say something? But you know, that makes people feel uncomfortable, and I think that's that's what it takes, and that's that's very difficult. We hear that a lot from people. Like it's really, really challenging. And even in school, when you know a child says something or a teacher says something, you know, and it's 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 really hard. And people are like, oh, I have to watch what I say. I'll watch what I do. And yeah, you do because now you you know right. you know there's there's no excuses anymore, like you said, because everything's on video. True. <laughs> Or we'll get on a video. <laughs> We're out of time, but I want to give people a chance if they need to talk to you or obviously the staff at the Y. Mm -hmm. How do they get in touch with you folks? Um, right now, the best way is uh, through um, email um, or go to our website, www.ywcasema.org. You can see, our, um, I'll go click on the staff piece. You'll see our numbers on there and our emails, and you can see all of the programs and services you know that we have. But the office is open you know, every day from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., located on 20. South 6th Street, so we have some limited, you know, hours, and our, our child care is open all day until the kids go back, and then we'll be open in the afternoons. There you go. For after school care, so no, no transition there. That's good seeing you. <laughs> nice we'll seeing you, We'll do it too, again. Jim. Nice to be here. That's going to do it for this edition of A Conversation With. I'm Jim Marshall. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you again soon.